Pleasure. love that you're bringing that actually because this is something that I don't talk enough. But in a way, my family made me a little bit racist. Okay, guys. Now, many of you know Maria. And you know that she's a very proud Spaniard, even to the point where it becomes a little bit annoying. But she is the most mouth-drinking, wine-tasting, cheese-eating, bleh, tortilla, paella, <laughs> cooking Spaniard woman I know. Yes, but I do not look Spanier. And because of this, I have faced a lot of criticism and I get questioned about my background in my home country up until this day. As an adult, it's annoying, but as a kid, it's damaging. And we know a lot of mixed kids around the world that has faced this issue and continue to do so. So we wanted to bring some attention and some light to this subject. Yeah, and luckily we've been able to find some amazing people that was willing to share their stories with us. Hi, my name is Natalia Chieco Arai, and I grew up being a mixed kid in New York City being half Salvadorian and half Japanese. I grew up speaking English exclusively. That's all we spoke at home. But when I was about seven, my mom decided she wanted to move back to El Salvador and she took me with her and enrolled me in school. I had to learn to speak Spanish while going to school. And I would come home after school and my mom would review my homework with me. She would go over my pronunciation. We would practice the A, A, E, O, U's nonstop until it was drilled into my mind and I became just as proficient in English as I became in Spanish. Um, ahora hablo español perfectamente y lo escribo, lo leo, puedo hablarlo perfectamente. Now, I never learned Japanese because my dad grew up in internment camp here in the United States. He is Japanese American, so during World War II he was interned and all the language schools were closed and they were forbidden from speaking Japanese in camp because it was considered to be um, anti-American um, or a secret spy language. So they were told, they were taught not to speak Japanese at all. And once the camps closed and they were back into their, back into their normal lives, they weren't allowed to have language schools. People who spoke Japanese were treated very poorly. They were treated as un-American, as traitors. So speaking Japanese was something that was not done. They tried to be as American as possible. So growing up, my dad just spoke very basic, um, informal Japanese inside the household. Going to school in Latin America in El Salvador, I was always seen as an outsider. They would say things like gringa estupida. They would make these, you know, faces at me and I never felt Salvadorian enough or, or Hispanic enough over there. And then I came back to the United States and was going to school here. And then I would be bullied in school because of being part Asian. I was never Hispanic enough. So one time, actually, I was playing basketball in the court. This was junior high school, so I was young. I was shooting hoops by myself, and these girls who would always call me names came to the court, and I was completely alone, and they started calling me names. And one of the girls said, you effing Jap. And I just, I had been taking karate lessons at that point. So for me, it was like, all right, I see these girls circling in on me, just punch the biggest one. Let's see what happens. I did it and I gave her a black eye and that was the day they left me alone. They didn't bother me at all. I was safe for junior high school. Then going to high school, I wasn't Hispanic enough to join the Latin American club, but I joined the Asian American club. And there I was welcomed with open arms. Um, nobody said to me like, you're just half or you're not enough. It was just like, Another Asian kid. I, I learned about Filipino culture, about, I learned Indian dance. I was able to share some karate with them and we made sushi and it was a wonderful experience. Then going to college, also college in the US, um, it was a little different of a dynamic. Then I became like the exotic girl. People didn't know that I was half. So sometimes they would make anti-Asian remarks in front of me and I would have to educate them in a, in a tactful way or let them know like, hey, I'm Asian myself. I've had questions from people asking me, 
do you feel more Latina or do you feel more Asian? Um, or, or making me pick and say I'm half this and half that. I think at a certain point, I realized that I couldn't just say I was half this or half that because it would be denying the other half. So now I don't say I'm half anymore. I say I'm Japanese and Salvadorian because that's who I am as a whole. And I've learned to embrace the fact that it comes with a lot of different perks and disadvantages too. Perks being, I feel like my parents, even though they are from very different cultures, they share the same family values and morals. So I never felt like a conflict there. And disadvantages being, you know, I wish I spoke Japanese. Um, because to some Asian people, I'm not Asian looking, or I guess to a lot of people, I'm not Asian looking, so I'm not Asian enough. But then to some Latinos, I speak different or I look too chinita or something. I want every mixed kid to know one thing. You are enough. When I say that, don't ever feel like you have to choose between one identity over the other. Don't feel like you are not enough because you don't speak the language or because you don't look a certain way. Just embrace the best things from your culture. Learn about the not so great things. Learn about how your cultures are similar or are very different. For instance, for my culture, we have so many different similarities. For instance, our immigrant experience that is very much common between both cultures. Learn that people will ask you questions. They'll be curious and they may want to know what is it like being mixed. It's okay. Be honest. Share with them. Because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and they will be surprised by how many things they have in common with us. So be a mixed kid, be proud, be yourself, and just enjoy the ride. Now I think that's crazy, the fact that she didn't get to learn Japanese from her father, and, yeah. and the situation obviously was a different time, but those things feel like you lose the piece of what makes you, you know, like a part of you in a sense, like that was kind of taken from her. And just the idea of going through school and the bullying, even though she did, you know, give that girl a black eye, you know, know how to throw them hands when you're in New York. No violence, no please. Violence, no, yeah, violence. no violence. <laughs> Good job. But again, just the fact that she couldn't join a certain group in a school mm -hmm. because, you know, they didn't find them to be Spanish enough and like not feeling welcome, you know, yeah. out of place in yeah. that situation. Yeah, it's horrible because at the end of the day, she wasn't enough Japanese, right? She wasn't enough Spanish, and she definitely wasn't enough American. You're never enough American. Yeah, like never. <laughs> You're not American I'm either. Not American. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can totally understand because my family is of Colombian heritage, and I moved to Colombia when I was 10. But before that, I had no idea about traditions, food, or anything. I wasn't raised in a Colombian family, in a typical Colombian family. So it was really hard for me to like go there. First, because to your point, it's like you're missing a part of your life, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's like you're a little bit lost, like you don't fit anywhere. Did you, now, sorry, did you learn any of the you know, cultures and traditions while you were there? Let's say that I spent like seven years over there or six years in Colombia and I didn't really get to learn about it until like the last two, three years that I was there because I was refusing for oh. some reason oh, to proud, get into proud it. Proud Spaniard coming out, huh? Yeah, I actually had my mother buying me food from Spain and in exporter imported into Colombia and I will deny to eat. Yeah, I was a brat kid. Anyway, <laughs> uh, my next point is that I don't even look necessarily Colombian like physically either. And so I had to face a lot of bullying in school as well because I was not accepted there either. I was called the Spaniard, the rich one, the one that stole our gold from 1495 <laughs> and Columbus and all that. So it was really tough. Yeah, and I think like for anyone that goes through something like that, especially at that age, like when you're still trying to develop who you are, that's the kind of question that you get stuck with. Who am I? Yeah. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Elisa y crecí siendo china en España. Eh, a mí me adoptaron a los nueve meses y a los dos años más tarde adoptaron a mi hermana. 
En ese viaje conocieron a otros padres que iban a adoptar a las niñas del mismo orfanato que mi hermana y desde entonces quedamos todos los años, eh, al menos una vez al año y compartimos muchísimas experiencias, muchísimos momentos. Realmente también es un grupo que nos apoyamos mucho en los sucesos que nos pasan, ya sean buenos o malos, eh, ya que muchos de ellos, nosotras mismas hemos vivido los mismos. Entonces, eh, compartir tus experiencias con gente que ha vivido lo mismo siempre es algo bueno y siempre es algo maravilloso y te ayuda muchísimo. Eh, yo solo hablo español porque cuando era pequeña mis padres me ofrecieron aprender chino y yo dije que no, que no me gustaba, que no me parecía muy difícil y ya está, o sea, y sigo pensando lo mismo realmente. Eh, yo, como me adaptaron tan pequeña yo no tenía ni idea del idioma y realmente no sería como recordar algo que ya sabías, sino aprender algo de cero y eso no, no me gustaba mucho, la verdad. Eh, pues realmente... Retos hay muchos de crecer siendo de otra raza en un país que no es el de tu origen. Y, o sea, casi todo realmente es un poco más difícil. O sea, a la hora de, por ejemplo, en el colegio con, cuando era pequeña, eh, hacer amigos y tal no se me dio nunca mal. O sea, realmente a los niños, creo yo, no parecía que les importase mucho la raza o, o el color de piel o lo que sea. Y de pequeña, pues más o menos muy bien, o sea, siempre hay algún comentario del típico niño y tal, pero yo siempre he sido una persona con muchísimo carácter y no toleraba ni una y no me cortaba un pelo en decirle al niño cualquier cosa o en pegarle o lo que sea, pero sin violencias, <risa> sino un empujoncillo o lo que sea cuando eres pequeña, pues tampoco es normal. Eh, ventajas, realmente yo creo que sería como llamar la atención, yo creo, porque, bueno, yo es que también es verdad que soy china, pero eh, soy muy alta, o sea, mido 1,75 y realmente no cumplo con el estereotipo de belleza en China, porque en China, pues más o menos, lo, lo bello es eh, medir como 1,50, 1,55, pesar 40 kilos, más o menos, ser menudita, pequeñita y tal, y yo pues soy todo lo contrario. Y en España realmente también soy muy alta para... O sea, si fuese española también sería muy alta. Estoy bastante por encima de la media de altura en España. Y también llamo la atención igualmente por el hecho de ser china, por el hecho de ser alta. O sea, siempre he llamado mucho la atención por eso. Así que eso a veces se convierte en una ventaja y otras veces se convierte en una desventaja cuando quieres más pasar desapercibida o cuando... pues lo que sea. Realmente a mí mis amigos nunca me han preguntado si me siento más china o española, pero me parece que es algo que se da por hecho porque de china solo tengo la cara, o sea, realmente todas mis expresiones, mi forma de hablar, eh, mi forma de pensar es española, o sea, es occidental, entonces eh, no lo sé, yo me siento más española, pero sin embargo nunca voy a rechazar mi, mi parte china ni voy a ocultarla, bueno, ni que pudiese, ¿no? Pero <risa> nunca voy a estar eh, avergonzada de mi parte china para nada. Eh, lo que sí que alguna vez me han dicho eh, mis amigos, pero bastantes veces, sobre todo cuando era más pequeñita, es eh, que se les olvida mucho que soy china. O sea, que dicen, eh, estamos hablando a lo mejor de algún tema de racismo, de adopción o de alguna cosa así, y me dicen, hostia, es que es verdad que tú eres china, tal como, perdón, tal, no me acordaba, dicen, es que a veces no me acuerdo, no sé qué. Yo digo, es que realmente no, no pasa nada, o sea, mientras no digas nada que, está en, que esté en contra de mis principios o digas algún comentario racista o lo que sea, no te voy a decir nada, porque yo, es que a veces a mí misma se me olvida que soy china, eh, no sé, en mi día a día, porque realmente es que... No, tampoco sabría con qué compararlo, ¿no? Porque nunca he estado en el cuerpo de una persona eh, blanca, por así decirlo, entonces no sabría. Pero es verdad que a mí a veces también se me olvida. Y algunas otras cosas que he experimentado así en mi día a día, eh, sobre todo ya cuando me he empezado a hacer un poco más mayor en la adolescencia y tal, eh, pues cuando conoces a grupos nuevos de gente, ya sea pues con intención de amistad o con intención de ligar o lo que sea, eh, siempre hay un grupo o una, bueno, unas personas en el grupo que te rechazan directamente, o sea, eh, te ven, ven que no eres española o que no eres blanca y tal, y mmm, directamente como que pierden un poco el interés en conocerte y tal. Eh, 
En chicos, por ejemplo, pasa más o menos algo parecido, o sea, para mí se dividen como en tres grupos. Eh, el primero es la gente que ni de coña tendría algo contigo porque les daría vergüenza admitir que han tenido algo con una persona de otra raza. Otra raza que no sea blanca, evidentemente, claro, o sea, que si son noruegas o por ejemplo inglesas o algo así, pues no hay ningún problema. Pero me refiero a razas con rasgos más fuertes, ¿sabes? Eh, directamente pues eso, que no tendrían nada contigo porque les avergonzaría admitirlo o lo que sea o ellos mismos, bueno, porque son racistas evidentemente eh, o porque a lo mejor, bueno, es algo que tampoco critico no les pareces eh, atractiva si eres de cierta raza para mí, es mo para mí eso no sabría si, decir, mm, si es racismo o no porque eh, el ideal de belleza de cada uno, pues bueno, es... Al el que impone la sociedad y el que tú también tú mismo te creas, así que para mí, bueno, pues ya está. Luego, eh, las personas a las que, que tienen casi un fetiche con eh, esa raza, básicamente, con, por ejemplo, con las asiáticas en mi caso, pues eh, chicos que he conocido y tal, que dicen, guau, es que a mí las asiáticas pues me gustan muchísimo, no sé qué, no sé cuál, y a mí esos tíos también me dan un poco de mal rollo, porque tampoco puedes sexualizar a alguien por su raza que solo te, te guste por eh, su raza y tal eso a mí me da bastante mal rollo y luego los chavales que realmente a mí me parece que merecen la pena que me gustan y tal, son a los que les dan completamente lo mismo la raza que, que tengas como, como seas y, y, y tal, esos son los que realmente merecen la pena porque no tienen ningún tipo de prejuicio, no tienen ningún tipo de idea, ya sea buena o ya sea mala y a mí me gusta eso, que me vean como que me vean de cero, sin tener ningún tipo de pensamiento anterior, solo por mi raza. Luego a mí, por ejemplo, también me surgen algunas dudas de, sobre mi carácter y mi personalidad, porque mmm, yo he llegado a la conclusión de que hay rasgos de tu carácter que realmente los aprendes por tu entorno, por donde vives, por cómo vives y tal, en plan tu familia, la sociedad y todo esto, y otros que son innatos, que los hereda realmente de, de tus padres biológicos. Y yo eh, realmente no me parezco en nada a ninguno de mis dos padres eh, adoptivos en cuanto a carácter, porque no he cogido tampoco, no he absorbido ningún rasgo suyo de su personalidad. Entonces yo a veces sí que me pregunto, el carácter que tengo, mis padres biológicos eh, tendrán ese mismo carácter, pero es la única duda que realmente tengo sobre eh, mis padres biológicos. O sea, hay alguna amiga que tengo que es adoptada que sí que les gustaría muchísimo conocer a sus padres biológicos y tal, eh, pero por, pues... Por curiosidad, más que nada, pues por decirles, bueno, pues has hecho esto, no te he guardado ningún rencor, eh, um, hiciste lo mejor para mí, o es que no podías tal, no podías eh, criarme, no podías mantenerme, pues no pasa nada. Eh, yo realmente, la única así eh, curiosidad que tengo sobre ellos, pues es eso, si mis padres biológicos serán en cuanto a físico y en cuanto a carácter parecidos a mí, porque eso me llama mucho la atención, ver a alguien que se parezca a mí físicamente tanto o si tengo hermanos biológicos o tal, eso es un tema que sí que me llama un poco la atención pero jamás ha sido un quebradero de, un quebradero de cabeza para mí o lo he pensado en exceso o no, eso a mí no me, no me importa mucho la verdad. También me han dicho alguna vez que si me maquillo tanto para ocultar mis rasgos. Eh, lo primero es que realmente creo que no habría ningún maquillaje lo suficientemente eh, fuerte como para ocultar unos rasgos así, pero eh, para mí yo siempre respondo que es todo lo contrario y es que es la realidad, todo mi maquillaje es alargado, alargando todo aún más, los rasgos, los ojos orientales y tal... Y realmente lo que hago es eh, exaltar aún más eh, mis rasgos asiáticos, no estoy intentando ocultar nada. Para mí es muy importante esto, yo cuando, o sea, yo siempre he sabido que era octada, siempre he sabido que era china y desde un principio pues me ha encantado el maquillaje y tal, y he dicho, a ver, ¿cómo me puedo maquillar siendo asiática? Porque antes pues no existía el Instagram y tal, y bueno, cuando era más pequeña pues tampoco miraba mucho YouTube o, o cosas así. Entonces eh, yo aprendí a maquillarme yo sola, yo mmm, dije, vale, la gente, mis amigas que son blancas, tienen rasgos eh, occidentales, se maquillan de esta manera, yo pruebo lo mismo, no me queda bien, no, no sé cómo maquillarme, eh, porque no tengo doble párpado lo primero y porque tampoco tengo cejas, entonces tenía que maquillarme de otra manera completamente distinta. Y yo misma pues fue eso, fui aprendiendo a, a maquillarme eh, en plan según mis rasgos y según mi cara, 
sin ningún tutorial y sin nada porque realmente los orientales lo, lo, en Japón, en Corea, en China y tal, no se maquillan así, no se maquillan como yo, se maquillan muchísimo más sencillo, muchísimo más eh, como disimulado y tal, o sea, yo realmente no he aprendido de ellos y tal, yo creo que he hecho un remix entre el maquillaje americano, español y tal, y, y, el, y el asiático, o sea, adaptándolo realmente a mis rasgos. Eso es una cosa muy curiosa que me ha pasado, claro, viviendo en España siendo china. Y bueno, yo un consejo que le daría a toda la gente que es de otra raza viviendo en un país que no es el de su origen, pues es realmente que defiendan sus principios, que, que no se avergüencen nunca de, de lo que realmente son, porque lo primero... Mmm, nunca lo vas a poder cambiar y lo segundo no tienes por qué cambiarlo, o sea, um, haz que la gente te acepte, enseña a la gente eh, sobre tus vivencias, sobre tus experiencias, sobre tus eh, casos de, de momentos que has vivido de racismo. Eh, si tú compartes tus experiencias, la gente yo creo que se va a sentir un poco más identificada, por así decirlo, o a lo mejor van a decir, vale, tú eres mi amigo, tú has vivido esto, no quiero que pase, y a lo mejor ellos mismos se van implicando aún más en la lucha racial, realmente. Eh, me parece muy importante, pues eso, enseñar a la gente lo que, lo que la gente racializada vivimos y en nuestro día a día y tal, ya sean experiencias buenas, experiencias malas, pero la verdad es que lo que es el privilegio, por así decirlo, de una persona eh, blanca en un país eh, occidental, um, es que realmente es un privilegio, o sea, la, todo se vive de una manera distinta, todo se vive de una manera eh, muchísimo más ventajosa, por así decirlo, eh, la gente racializada nos tenemos que buscar un poco más pues otros caminos por así decirlo en muchísimas ocasiones o tenemos que defendernos de ataques y de cosas que la gente no racializada nunca tendría que defenderse eh, y también otro consejo es eh, no creerte nunca menos de lo que eres o sea eh, muchas veces sí que eh, hemos hablado amigas mías y yo eh, amigas adoptadas pues de que hay situaciones en las que se han sentido bastante inferiores porque la gente les ha tratado de manera diferente o porque la gente eh, no las ha aceptado o no les ha hecho el mismo caso que si fuese una persona blanca por ejemplo tú, tú y una amiga tuya eh, blanca os presentáis en un grupo eh, y a lo mejor de, de ti pasan más no tienen tanto interés en conocerte como a tu amiga que sí es blanca y esas experiencias realmente no tienen que, que marcarte en la manera de ser ni nada. O sea, realmente tienes que ser como tú eres, reaccionar pues lo mejor posible también, te digo, a, a ataques racistas y tal. Enfadarse muchas veces no sirve de nada, pero siempre tienes como que imponerte y no dejar que te vacilen porque... Yo creo que eso sería un grave error si dejas que se metan contigo desde que eres pequeño, de mayor luego te vas acostumbrando y ya lo ves normal, lo normalizas y realmente eso nunca tendría que ser normal. Y es un placer haber hecho este vídeo para vosotros. Muchísimas gracias por dejarme participar. Un besito. Muchas gracias. Now there's a lot to unpack in that and I there's so many things that I wasn't aware of that I wouldn't think about of what she discussed and said because first off Growing up at that age, I think the more important thing was that she had a comfort zone where she had a support group. And I think that's really important and actually something that a lot of kids don't get. And having that to kind of build your confidence in a sense or to feel comfortable to be able to talk about those things that you deal with with somebody that can understand is important. Yeah. Now, I, I have no idea about the dating life in Spain. That's, that's totally, totally outside my, you know, area of expertise. So <laughs> I'm gonna leave that to you. Yeah, it's actually something that I, totally lived and experienced and it was very frustrating because I feel like I was always a pretty girl right uh, but I Sexy. didn't have <laughs> I didn't have that luck in Spain if you must call it in a way because of the description that she's saying there's a lot of people that look at you and they know that you're not 100% Spaniard and they just don't want to do anything with you like they don't even want to flirt like nothing like it no and then you have another group of people that you know 
look and at you and it's like, okay, you know what? I can do something exotic, you yeah, know? Yeah, but then it's like creepy and dirty. I totally agree with Elisa about her point of view on that. Um, so, yes, I, I agree with that dating life now. Guys just sound bad over there in Spain right now. I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, it's kind of tough for us different looking people, I have to say. I hope it changes in the future. And by the way, I love that Elisa is sharing her experience because now I don't feel alone. Like I had that <laughs> same experience in Spain. But anyway, working in the makeup industry for so many years, I worked there for 15 years. And it is true that when I transferred from Spain to the US, one of my biggest fear was to do eyeliners on Asian girls and do color matching for black girls because we don't have that experience in Spain. Um, so I can totally understand where she's coming from with that. But I love that she came out of her show and she was like, you know what? I'm gonna mix what I learned from Asia and what I learned from America and what I got from Spain. Yeah, and she emphasized yeah. everything about what yeah. makes her feel like you know, her true self. I yeah. like that. And now with that being said, she also talks about that she would like to see somebody that looks like her. And that just reminds me of the movie um, Tar Tarzan? Tarzan. Tarzan. Um, well, what she was saying like she wanted to meet her, like just to see her parents, like I think that's really important to like to see like what makes you you, like how mm -hmm. you got put together in a sense, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, because in the movie like this little boy is always trying to look like the gorillas and he wants to fit in the manada, in like the group. The family. Yeah, but then the father is like, no son, <laughs> you don't look like me, you're, you're not, not my son, son. <laughs> you're not one of us, you're not yeah. one of us. Yeah. And, yeah, you're and right. That, that's I never thought about that. Wow, damn. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like you, you know, you're trying. You're you feel like this is home, in a but sense. It's not. In a sense, everyone. This is all you know. Mm -hmm. This is home to you. Like this is what you live and breathe, and yet the people there telling you, no, you don't belong here. Yeah. I, yeah, that's... And of course it's different because Elisa, just like I did, we had a great family that welcomed us and like loved us. So it's not the same ca case. Right, right, right. No, I'm just but saying. it's just like you don't look like the rest of the people, so you feel out of the place. Yeah, that's not cool at all. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marlena and I'm mixed, half Japanese, half German. I grew up, I was born and raised in Germany. Um, but then I also lived in Tokyo for five years, so I have both experiences. Hi, I'm Mina. Um, I'm also half-half. Uh, my mom is German and my dad is Mexican, so I'm half German, half Mexican. I mostly grew up in Germany, but I did uh, high school in Mexico, in Mexico City, so I also lived some years in Mexico. And Since when I grew up in Germany, I went for a vacation to visit my grandma and my family, like once or every two years. I grew up with both languages, so we spoke Japanese at home, and then, but we, we were living in Germany, so um, in, within our family, uh, we would only be allowed to speak Japanese because my parents really wanted us to learn Japanese, and both of my parents are really strict, <laughs> so my mom wouldn't really reply if I was talking in German with her, then like she would be like, no, I'm not talking to you unless you're speaking Japanese. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, and my dad, even though he's German, uh, he's a Japan nerd, so he loves everything about Japan. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and so he's fluent in Japanese as well. That, of course, helped to maintain the language at home. Yeah. Uh, I also grew up with both languages. My dad uh, spoke with us in Spanish all the time, but he worked a lot, so it was mostly in the evenings that when he came from work, it was like, how was school, how are you? And with my mom, I speak in German, but um, my mom is also fluent in Spanish, so when we are with our Mexican family, they can't speak German, so we uh, speak in Spanish. I think it's interesting because a couple of days ago when we were traveling, we were talking sort of like that um, in what was difficult growing up in a mixed family. And for us, it was also um, how strict our parents were because I don't know it, if it's a stereotype, but like Japanese parents and maybe also Mexican parents are a bit stricter than Germans like German you know in Germany when you're 16 you're basically allowed to go out to clubs you're allowed to drink you're allowed to you know smoke is 18 now but back then it was actually 16 so a lot of things like are very early and for my mom coming from Japan she was just like what a horrible daughter I have you know <laughs> like drinking at 16 like one time I came home at when I was 15 I was like super drunk it was probably the first times I was drunk with my friends 
and yeah, she was just um, really shocked about the fact, you know. Um, so curfews were just, we had, I had to be back home at like 8 p.m., 10 p.m. That's when my friends started going out, you know. So I would always be like, why is everyone allowed to do that and not me? And then they'd be like the standard response, well, I'm your parent, you know, it's our rules. Um, but I think it was really hard because not because of the fact that you had to be home at 8 p.m. But because of the fact that it was different for everyone else and that you didn't get to do these experiences or talk about these experiences that everyone else was having. So in a sense, it really felt like I was left out, not on purpose, but because of the rules of my parents. Mm -hmm. um, and that really continued up until I was like 18, 19. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I had a similar experience, but uh, for my parents, it was more mostly for my dad because he worked a lot and only on weekends uh, he had the chance to spend time with the family. So it was very important for him that uh, we be there for uh, breakfast and uh, for the uh, family meals. time. Yeah. 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 And we always have big breakfast and so when I was allowed to have a sleepover at my friends houses but I had to be back for breakfast and I always was so angry because I had to get up at I don't know very early and get back home and I was like why but then I saw the nice breakfast and it yeah. was okay. <laughs> yeah. And in school, um, I really felt that um, I had really good experiences in school because um, um, I always had the chance to talk about Mexico. Like in geography, I talked about earthquakes in Mexico. In English class, I talked about migration to the US. Um, I, I got the chance to talk a lot about Mexico and also my father was invited to, the, to school because there were none other Mexican kids like uh, in my school and he did like uh, on project days he had there was Mexico day and he brought food and gave talks but um, I also felt like looking back at it I felt a little bit strange sometimes because I know there were kids who were not allowed to talk about their countries and it's always like the same uh, country like there were kids from Turkey and um, a lot of uh, kids and they never got the chance to talk about uh, what they eat. There are also earthquakes in Turkey and now I feel like uh, I know there's a uh, yeah, um, Unterschied, um, difference. a difference where you're from and I got the chance to do so and my, my, and my parents also involved in school and they were like um, I was always proud to be mixed mm. and um, I always like when I'm when somebody asks me now it's like wow you're from Mexico and Germany great combination I always get like compliments for it I remember one situation where I was walking through the city with my mom and then there were like some youth, like maybe 15, 16. And then as we were walking by, you know, they made some racial comments or like made noises or like faces to us. So that's something, but it's actually a single event that I remember and towards myself, um, I think in Germany, not so much um, in Japan. Sometimes I feel that they're racist uh, behaviors without them trying to be racist. So where, you know, my Japanese, I don't really have a Japanese, uh, like, or foreign accent in my Japanese, but I do like look different. Yeah. Um, and so wherever I go, like, it's not accepted that I'm Japanese. It's more like, oh, how, like, how do you speak Japanese so well? Or like, you know, so. Yeah. I'm always treated differently. I will never be treated as a Japanese just based on the fact that I'm not looking fully Japanese. Yeah. I mean, I do have Japanese citizenship. Um, yeah, I don't know. But it's always when I enter Japan and I'm in the line for Japanese immigration, they always wave me over and they're like, no, no, foreigners lines over there until I hold them, my, you know, show them my passport. And I'm like, no, I am Japanese. And then they're like, oh, OK. <laughs> so things like that. I don't yeah. think they mean to be racist, but then, yeah, it is. You, you do feel like you're different. You're yeah. treated differently. Yeah. Yes, I feel in Germany, even if you look a bit different, if you speak accent-free, it's sort of like 
they know you're you were born and raised here, mm -hmm. so you, they kind of accept you as German. I mean, sometimes you still get questioned like, oh, like is some part of your family somewhere, you know, from somewhere else, which, you know, is, yeah, like just by, based on looks, mm -hmm. uh, they do ask, but I do feel that there's a difference between Japan and Germany already, you know? Yeah. In Germany, it's more, do you speak the language fluently? And in Japan, it's really looks. Yeah, at the beginning when I was in high school, I had a different accent because I mostly learned Spanish from my dad and from my grandpa. So I think I spoke really old, Spa like Mexican <laughs> Spanish and my friends were like, why is she? Like my jokes were like from grandpas, I think. So I think that was, they, they felt like, uh, yeah, you, you... Time jumped. <laughs> yeah, it, I think it was weird for them. But uh, after a while, I, um, I think I... Uh, adapted myself uh -huh. and um, you were like Benjamin Button like getting younger <laughs> and younger <laughs> and um, also my at my school there were a lot of mixed uh, kids um, I was at a German school but it's an international school so there were international kids so if I moved in in those uh, spaces I was like a normal kid but where my grandpa lives like in his neighborhood everyone knows us because we are been going there for many years and like in the market they're like wow they actually call me blonde there they're like <laughs> Where and they're so happy when my family is back and they all call us like blonde kids and it's always so funny because in Germany I had like um, older sisters of my friends when I was a kid I remember they wanted to touch my hair because they wow you have black hair and so much hair and they wanted to brush my hair and then I went to Mexico for vacation and they always called me blonde I was very yeah. confused <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's super interesting yeah it reminds me of one instance when I uh, because I went to university in Japan I did my bachelor's there and yeah in Germany everyone told me I have black hair and then in Japan first week of classes we had we played this game where you had to put down like five attributes about yourself and then like uh, you know in, you put them all in a pot and then you draw them and you read out the attributes and everyone had to guess who it is and I put down like black dark yeah no black hair mm -hmm what else anything right and then no one guessed me no one guessed me because at the end they're like hair. you have brown hair why did you put down black and I'm like but I was told my whole life that I have black hair you know so I was the only one who was not guessed <laughs> I didn't experience a lot of that but I always felt my I know that my father experienced he was he arrived also in the 80s to Germany and in, in where we from Heidelberg is a small city and my dad was really, uh, he, he's very tall and um, yeah, like people said, wow, your dad is so exotic always. And the only thing that was a bit, and my father always laughs about that, because um, he cooks with a lot of spices mm -hmm. and <laughs> I was always afraid of like smelling of ah. the spices because other German kids, they always told me, oh, garlic smells so bad and all the kids smelling of garlic and I was always afraid that like somebody would smell that yeah it was yeah. really and we went to dance classes when we were like 14 mm. and um, it was always the boys had to pick with which girl to dance and on Fridays my dad decided to cook fish so always when I came home lunch and then I, the, the whole flat smell of fish, I was crying, said, you make my life horrible and I can't go to oh. dance class now, nobody will pick me. Yeah, and he laughs about that so much. Just one more thing on the lunch or like the, that you were scared that you smelled like food or something because I have had a similar experience actually that in Japan it's really common to uh, that moms make um, bento boxes yes. yeah I yeah I know <laughs> I love them too now now yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. and then you would have like onigiri which is yeah, yeah and with like algae around it and so yeah and then I would have that and then back then yeah my, my classmates would be like ooh that smells weird you know because it would smell fishy because yeah. of the algae 
and yeah and so then i asked my mom actually to stop making them i was like yeah it must have been heartbreaking for her but actually she was like no it's really good because i don't have to wake up early to make them if you want german food fine i give you bread and cheese you know and then it was bread and cheese and then actually when i was like starting to be 15 16 it was cool again you know and then like i asked her to make them again because all my friends were jealous that i had bento boxes oh, I'm yeah <laughs> Yeah, same with me now, yeah. everyone. Can you cook Mexican yeah, food, yeah. please? But back then, it was like, uh, I don't want to come, go yeah. to your house so to... Weird. Yeah. 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 And so I, yeah, and I wonder if it's a generational thing that, you know, now, like, in, interracial or, like, different cultures is more, ex, you know, how do you say, appreciated? Mm -hmm. Or if it's also a, an age thing, maybe a mix of both, but that, you know, at a certain age, you're more, like, singling out people that are different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but now, yeah, everyone is just like ce celebrates that I'm mixed and I'm different. Yeah, yeah. a lot. Okay. Mostly during a football championship, oh. <laughs> they always <laughs> which team are you? <laughs> like I don't know. Paul, that's the really strong ones. Mexico and Germany, like one of the biggest soccer teams. Yeah, football teams, so yeah. it'd yeah. be like no, I have double the chances of winning. <laughs> yes. Yes. I got my money on both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, quite. I that I, I experience the same. That you have to answer what you have to say the percentage, or I don't know what of you is Mexican, what of you is German, and it's like I don't know <laughs> how can I answer that. I like uh, in short conversations they are okay if I say my dad is Mexican, my mom is German, I grew up in Germany, I did high school in Mexico. That's okay, but some of them. Are like okay but what is your heart and <laughs> it's different it changes yeah. sometimes I feel very German sometimes I feel very Mexican and sometimes I really just feel mixed mm -hmm. I feel like it's and okay. and yeah. I feel like um, that's what she said at the beginning like there is a bondage I, I have a lot of friends that are mixed and it's like some somehow they have the same experiences and um, yeah I think it's also an identity to be half half and not to be to decide for what mm. yeah yeah i feel very similar i mean yeah i, I uh, usually when i say i'm mixed then the follow-up question is like do you feel more german do you feel more japanese i don't feel offended by it too much um i guess i understand where they're coming from but i also don't think that there's an answer to it um, because really it's both and I think the point that you made about you know it differs at moments as well is so true and I think that's true about other things like character characteristics about yourself as well right like in some periods of times you uh, I don't know feel more adventurous than other times and in the same way like that as well like you know when I spent a long time in Japan then I feel a bit more Japanese maybe um, and other times I feel more German. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There's no answer to it. It's fluid, it's yeah. fluid. Is it? I think you oftentimes mix people, even if they're, when they're put in new situations, they know how to adapt really quickly because they knew, they, you know, uh, because I feel with, no, it's a bit loud in the background. <laughs> the <laughs> but, mic will help. Okay. Way. Yeah, no, but um, because you're constantly put in different situations, even just with, you know, switching languages, you know, how you ad have to adapt your brain, like it's kind of automatic, but it still happens. And I think um, with switching the language, also you sort of switch a little bit the mindset or like the cultural background and the nuances of what it means, etc. And I think because we're trained in that, um, yeah, I think uh, one of the skill sets that we learned is also that, yeah, when you put us somewhere, it's quite easy to adapt to that situation yeah. or to the people. I think so too. It also has a downside though, because sometimes I notice that I adapt too much or too quickly and I kind of forget myself, you know, because I'm so good at adapting that I'm like, hmm, wait a minute, like, is that really me or is that just me adapting, you know? Um, so, but I guess as I'm growing older, I know more and more about myself now and who I am and who I want to protect. Um, and I think you can do it That's maybe process, more yeah. uh, on purpose rather than yeah. 
that it happens. Yeah. I think my message would be <laughs> uh, mixed is good. Um, it's great. It always enriches. I think it doesn't necessarily mean two cultures, you know? It means different genders, different nationalities, different cultures, different backgrounds. No matter what, but mix is always good. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's very simple, but that would be my message. And I think one important thing is be who you are. And uh, if you're mixed, if you're not mixed, if you're this, if you're that, I think it's important who you are and that it's uh, something dynamic, something fluid. It can change. You can be uh, shy now, you can be an extrovert tomorrow, you can be whatever you want. And um, yeah, I think diversity is great. and also like respect that and um, people um, will talk about it the people who are ready for it to talk about they will tell you their stories and people um, who are like in another process now maybe they don't want to talk about uh, why they're mixed or where they come from and i think that's also important there are great stories to tell and people will come and tell them I kind of don't even know what to say about all of this now because uh, the, the the actions that she said that uh, Marlena said that they take in Japan, like when she's going through mm -hmm. the the uh, passport line and and having to be waved over, and be like, nah, son, I'm Japanese. I got <laughs> I got my citizenship here. Yeah. Like, you know, I know those behaviors do come off wrong, and and obviously it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. But it, it's still concerning though. I mean, regardless of how we do it, like you speak perfect Japanese. And you might not look fully Japanese, but it shouldn't come off where, like how you, oh, you speak great Castilian. I mean, you face that everywhere you go here, and not here in Spain, we're not in Spain, that's it right now. <laughs> but, but still, like I've watched like people still question you about, oh, where are you from? Uh, Madrid. Oh, what about your mother? Uh, Madrid. Um, so your grandmother? What, do you, what, what else you want to know? I'm yeah. from Madrid, I speak Castilian, what's your problem? Yeah, but it is true, like in Japan, there is a law that in order for you to be considered Japanese, you have to have at least three yeah, yeah. things of Japanese. Generations, generations is the word, oh my there God. You go. <laughs> but, but still though, I don't think it should be that bad because how many things are, how many, how much people are still pure? Like I, I found out recently in the 23 Me that I have Irish in me. I, I have, 30%. I'm like 30% Irish. It's probably why I've never been drunk and why I can't get drunk. But you know, thank you to my heritage <laughs> over there. But, and I, but again, I don't know if I would be accepted in Ireland if I was to go over there. I don't know how they would. I don't think so. Oh, you don't I, look Irish I don't, at all. <laughs> there, I, I think I stand up just a little bit, just a little just bit. Just a little bit. But again, it's still, at the end of the day, like, I don't know how much oh, well, I, I did my test, but mm -hmm. everyone has so much different stuff that's with, mixed into us now that there's nothing that's necessarily pure any longer. So how mm -hmm. can we really hold people to that standard and kind of discriminate against it? Yeah, especially when there's families, like in both of their cases, right? Marilena and Nina, their families like kept the traditions. They yes. uh, cook their food. They proudly talk about their customs and traditions and everything which else. Is, which is hilarious from Nina's part about the Mexican yeah. food and not <laughs> smelling like it in school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so like at least they got that mix, right? I didn't get that. And that's, I think, one of my most frustrating parts because Obviously, first, I feel like that piece that you said before, that a piece is missing in, in to my whole story. But besides that, it's like people already box me into, oh, you're not a Spaniard, you're something else. I don't care what, but you're something else. When in reality, what I feel the most is the Spanish, Spanish, like yeah. Spaniard. And so I don't face the same thing of like people forcing me to choose a side. Like, are you more Spaniard or Colombian? No, they automatically box me into out of Spain, which is totally <laughs> opposite of how I feel. So I think that that is like, Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's right that people can, in a sense, like try to identify you for you. It's just like, I know who I am. This yeah. is who I am. This is who I, I was born as I was born. This is what I practiced. This is what I was born and raised, the culture that I know and how are you going to tell me I'm not that? That's like me. That's like you trying to tell a New Yorker, hey, you know, you're not from New York. You can't be from New York. That's, that's a fight. <laughs> that is that's a fight. That's a fight. You tell a New Yorker they're not from New York, you ready to get an ass whipping. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's just, and that's how it's going down. But you can't try to put 
somebody's identity because of what you feel they should be or what you believe them to be? Actually, a story that I have never told you is my best friend, Alicia, because she knew of all the struggles that I had when I was growing up. She would always say, who's telling you that? I'll go and I'll tell them <laughs> that you know how to dance flamenco and you were born here and I saw you since you were two years old and I know all about your life. <laughs> so You know, this is the thing that happens with kids though. And and I'm gonna say something that that people that I don't think we realize because I it's been told to me like when we make those jokes towards kids like say if I knock over a glass of milk or something or I'm doing something clumsy like maybe my mother might say oh well you get that from your father's side or my dad might say you, well you get that from your mother's side yeah. and you don't realize how much that necessarily affects you as a kid where mm -hmm. you start thinking about it all you start judging am I doing this because my family's from X or am I doing this because my my dad's side of family's from Y and yeah. again that's what happens to kids like that's so I it's so yeah, damaging. I love that you're bringing that actually because this is something that I don't talk enough but in a way my family made me a little bit of racist when I was growing up because like anything that I would do that I wasn't proud of myself like something like mischievous or something that I shouldn't have been doing immediately my mind would think like oh this must be my Colombian side because all the bad things happen from my Colombian side <laughs> and that is just wrong right like I shouldn't have thought like that when I was a teenager like, and all the stereotypes that, that they can go through like oh okay well she must obviously yeah. cook this because she has Mexican in her or yeah. or she has to be smart or good at math because she has Asian or, or Chinese or Japanese in them yeah and it makes you refuse a part of it like it's like you start like hating yourself because of the combination of or the stereotypes that people yeah. force on you like yeah. that's Man, and you know, a lot of kids go through this still and we have to kind of protect them from these things because when you're at the age of growing up as a kid, mm -hmm. teenager, young adult, there's still people trying to figure out who they are at 40 years old and, yeah. and that's fine, but when you're trying to still figure it out when you're in your teenage years or even in your younger years, this is something that plays a major role in trying to find your identity. And, and you keep receiving just pushing back from everywhere, right. like refusing Right, and the second that you, in a sense, found find a home, like this is what I feel is me, you and you have people kind of trying to, you know, push you away from like, no, that's not you. You that's that is that isn't who you are. And, yeah, it's and making you doubt yourself. Yeah, and whether we want to accept it or not, it's kind of racist in some cases. Yeah, right? it's definitely racist, and we have to learn to kind of embrace all races, mixed races and any anything else aliens immigrant whatever it is everything so our message is please embrace these mixed kids if they're around you if you are a mixed kid just believe in yourself take your whole as yeah. a whole whatever you are don't pick anything or just be like um all. be like um, uh nina when she's like you know when it comes down to football then you know you got yeah, the best of both worlds you know you know what side to pick then you, you got two like like uh what Marlena said now you got the best bowls. You got two chances of winning now. Yeah, that's true. Not like me. Today is Thursday. <laughs> Yesterday, Spain played. And, well, I don't know because today is not Thursday right. when we're recording this. I'm making this too long for no reason. I hope Spain made it in I, the UEFA Euro Cup. <laughs> but anyway, guys, again, remember, these are things that ask friends that you know that are mixed and ask them how they feel. Like, don't sit there and try to give them an identity. Don't that, judge them. Right. Careful if you want to learn something, if you want to ask questions, hey, by all means, ask questions. Some of them might feel comfortable to talk about it. Some might need a little bit more time because I'm sure that a lot of them face these kind of situations and these kind of mental um, damaging questions. Yes, and mental health. Yeah. Absolutely. So guys, please give this video a like if you've enjoyed it. If you learned something new, thank you to everyone that did participate. We really appreciate you guys being a part of this because we know it's not necessarily easy now topic to talk about. Now I don't feel alone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to connect more. And as always, remember to live the life you want, love the life you live, and travel. Mamuchas out.